Okay, so um, I'm going to do uh, try to do three things today. The first is um, just to describe uh, uh, the physics of a classical relativistic particle in an electromagnetic field. And then uh, that, and I'll derive the Hamiltonian for that system. Then I'll take the non-relativistic limit of that. And then we'll um, add a Pauli spin term and look at uh, uh, the hydrogen atom in the magnetic field. And, um, and then, uh, uh, let's see, what, but then we'll look at the linear star effect as the uh, third topic. I don't know if we'll get to the third topic. The, um, okay, so what's this relativistic uh, charged particle in the electromagnetic field? For some reason, I worked this out in SI units. Um, I was no fan of SI units, um, but somehow I I did that. Anyway, um, so the basic idea is we have an electromagnetic field which um, has four components, and that last component is going to be related to the uh, scale of potential, so phi in fact, uh, that is to say, phi over C is going to be A with an upper zero. And the metric I'm using, uh, the flat space metric is the same one Finley uses, which is to say you put the time component. Um, when the uh, vector index is up, everything is plus sign. And when the indices are down, the time index gets flipped. The Lagrangian, or let me write down in fact the action. Well, the action, which will be an integral of Lagrangian dt, is going to be minus mc, an integral, and this is, you can write this as square root of dxa, dxa, and then the next term is particle charge q, it's an integral ab, of x and t uh, dx b. And so the, the particle shows up merely through its x coordinates, which appear both in this line integral and in the argument of the uh, four vector potential up here. And here, this, this, this uh, term here can also be written as minus mc integral, this is the proper time d tau plus q integral ab dxb. So this is a line integral and this is just a proper time integral. Um, I'll just mention in passing that this proper time integral becomes uh, awkward if the particle has mass zero because then uh, the proper time is zero, and you need to use a different formalism, which is actually the most subtle formalism. But fortunately, we get away with using mass of particle most of the time, even though, of course, in the standard model, all the particles are thought to be massless before symmetries are broken, but we still have mass, because that's the standard model that may change after the LHC experiments. Um, this, by the way, do break in with questions. I came with a supply of um, small candy treats. Um, all right, dxa, dxa here is c squared dt squared minus dx squared. And um, another way of writing that is c squared dt squared times 1 minus b squared over c squared. So, um, and of course, v here is just dx. Okay, so this action um, can also be written as um, an integral dt 
and first minus M C squared, right, there was an extra C, square root of 1 minus V squared over C squared. You see why this doesn't work for a massless particle. The particle, this would just be zero. And then we have plus Q A dot V. That's from, well, let's see, maybe I've gone a little too fast here. Let's just write this again. Minus M C integral D tau plus Q. And the vector part of this is A dot DX. And then it's minus, um, let me just see where I am. Okay, P over C times um, simply uh, DX zero here, and that's CDT. So the C's cancel in that uh, last term. And then if we want to rewrite this all as a time integral, let me just leave the D tau as it is. Uh, well, all right, if I'm switching it to this, then you have a DT, and then you have in here a, um, a uh, this D tau pulls out a CDT, so that makes C squared, and then that's here is 1 minus C squared over C squared. And this term becomes plus Q um, uh, A dot V DT, because V DT is DX, and then you have minus uh, V DT. Okay, so, and, and there's a Q on this. I forgot the Q now. This Q multiplies all of this. So all together then, when we get back here, we have minus QV. So that's the action. And so we can identify the square brackets as the Lagrangian. And by the way, as emphasized by Weinberg in his volume one on quantum field theory, the Lagrangian is useful for the purpose of symmetry. The action is supposed to be a scalar, and it's supposed to be invariant under whatever symmetries we have. And um, so you see it here, it's d tau, that's a relativistically invariant quantity. This is the inner product of two four vectors, it's relativistically invariant. So Lagrangian is good for symmetries. But on the other hand, when you want to find out what's actually happening, you have to get to the Hamiltonian, at least in ordinary. So Lagrangian here is a minus mc squared, square root of 1 minus p squared over c squared, plus q a dot v minus q v. And the momentum, which is, what I mean here is momentum that's canonically conjugate to the position. This stuff is on the web, by the way. But as I said, for some reason I did it in uh, SI units, and um, and then in my my notes when I went on to to get to the quantum mechanical part, I sort of the, I I continued to some extent the SI units, and so I'm going to have to correct the units to I'm going to go to atomic units. Uh, Anyway, this then, you take the partial root of Lagrangian with respect to V, you differentiate this term, this term, and nothing happens there. And so what you get here is MV over the square root of 1 minus P squared over C squared plus QA. Okay, and this is, this is, a, this is, this must have been a big surprise the first time people saw it, and I think it must be a big surprise to students whenever they see it for the first time. Frankly, I'm seeing it for the 50th time, and it's still a big surprise to me. Um, it's, it's really quite mysterious here. The variable canonically conjugate to position is the mechanical momentum plus QA. This is a point emphasized by Konopinski, and it's very good book on electrodynamics, which unfortunately never caught on. 
Instead, everybody opted for the sadistic effects of Clark Jackson. And um, whereas what Konopitsky points out is that this, this thing is really a momentum. Anyway, so the mechanical momentum, which I'm going to write as P mech, is mv over root 1 minus b squared over c squared, and it's equal to the canonical momentum minus qa. So that's puzzling. By the way, there's a deeper sense in which this is puzzling, because this mechanical, this canonical momentum, um, this canonical momentum here involves a mechanical momentum plus A, but A is a function of X and T. So the coordinate to which it is canonically conjugate is inside the argument of the electromagnetic field. And that's not something to be ignored. That actually is real. Okay, so this... Um, was, uh, I think you've seen this before, but anyway, it's still quite surprising. Now, in order to get to the Hamiltonian, we have to, as you know, find velocity, express it in terms of the canonical momentum, and then for, take the quantity PV minus L and write that all in terms of X and P, where P is the canonical momentum. So I'm going to try to do that for you now. It turns out that this is a little more algebraically complicated than most manipulations in classical mechanics. Um, but uh, we've got to face up to it because this is what it is. So this v over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared is p minus qa over m. And so v squared over 1 minus v squared over c squared is p minus q a squared over m squared. And so what you find then is that uh, b squared is equal to p minus q a squared over m squared divided by 1 plus p minus q a squared over mc squared. So that's, I can imagine the first guy doing this, the first person doing this must have said, Jesus Christ, where is this leading? Um, but uh, it eventually works out. Um, one then has 1 minus b squared over c squared then turns out to be simply just doing the arithmetic. It's one for doing algebra, I should say. P minus QA squared over M squared C squared. And so now if we take the square root, we have that over that. And so that then tells us that V is just this structure times that square root. And that means that V is equal to 1 over M P minus QA um, divided times the square root, which means divided by the square root of 1 plus P minus QA squared over M squared C squared. So that's... Um, a somewhat daunting expression. On the other hand, when we actually formulate what the Hamiltonian is, um, these things basically work out. I'm trying to figure out how to manage the blackboard. So I'll start with H is then PV, P dot V minus L. And so just working this out, this is P dot, and we have our expression for V here, so it's 1 over M, P minus QA, over this huge square root. Let me, can I just call this huge square root 1 plus, all right, because it's, it's 
going to come up over and over again. All right, that's one term. Now we've got to subtract. So we've got this first um, term here. The second term is minus m c squared times the square root. But the square root is this, and so and we subtract the Hamilton the Lagrangian. So this becomes plus m c squared divided by the square root. And now we have to subtract this term, a dot b, and so this is minus q a dot v, and v is right there, so we have 1 over m, p minus q a over the big square root, and then we just have plus q p. And um, so now, um, when we combine these, you see the big square root occurs in uh, all three of those uh, first terms. And so this turns into H is equal to MC squared, which is comforting, plus 1 over M P minus QA squared divided by Divided by big square root, maybe I'll write this square root for a change. It's only occurring once here. P minus QA squared over M squared C squared plus Q P. Okay. So that's our Hamiltonian. But now we see that in fact this numerator looks a lot like the argument of the square root. And in fact, if we um, multiply top and bottom by m, then this becomes m squared c squared plus p minus qa squared divided by now we've multiplied by m, and m has come in here. The m becomes an m squared, of course, cancels this one. And then we want to pull through a, we want to multiply by c in here, so we have to divide by 1 over c there, or effectively multiply by c up here. And so one way of writing it is putting a, uh, a c here, and then down here, what we have is the square root of m squared c squared plus p minus q a squared uh, plus q p. And so now um, we see that we've got a really quite remarkable expression for the Hamiltonian. Namely, the Hamiltonian is c times the square root of m squared c squared plus p minus q a squared plus q p. So this is our final expression then for the Hamiltonian of a relativistic particle of mass and in charge q in an electromagnetic field described by the vector potential a and the scale potential p and again SI units. Um, so at first glance you say, Jesus, uh, this is really a pretty weird expression, the square root. In other words, what we've got is not simply a polynomial, it's actually an algebraic expression. Um, I think that's the mathematical term. On the other hand, it's comforting that it gives us back the thing that we expect. If we set the electromagnetic field equal to zero, it gives us that h is equal to uh, c square root of m squared c squared plus p squared, which is exactly what we expect. Another way of writing that is square root of m squared c to the four plus c squared p squared. And this is the standard relativistic formula for a point particle in that sense with momentum p. And this, in fact, is, is blank. I check by wiki. Um, 
All right. Any questions? See, this is the reason why I have such deep suspicions about the way we teach physics. Here we're talking about a classical relativistic particle, an electromagnetic field. I mean, that's pretty basic. And yet the mechanics that's involved gives us something that's really different from the mechanics that's emphasized in, say, the book by Goldstein or most mechanics books. All right. Now, I'll emphasize once again, A has as its argument X and T, and X is the position of the particle. If we want, we can introduce spin. And what I'm going to do, though, is I'm first going to go to the non-relativistic limit. And the non-relativistic limit, the Hamiltonian then is MC squared plus P minus QA squared over 2M plus Q theta. So that's the non-relativistic limit. And this thing then is a constant, and one normally drops the constant because it just adds something to the constant for the energy. Of course, you know, when you go to the non-relativistic limit, you really can't drop the main term because that is the main term. But so you've got to have it in for at least one equation before you drop it. Yeah, is that a question? Is this gauge invariant? Great question. What are you referring to, the Hamiltonian? Good question. Let me just think. Let's put it this way. This little structure here is intrinsically gauge invariant. Okay, P minus QA. And, in fact, this is also intrinsically gauge invariant. So I'm going to say yes. The point is that under a gauge transformation, what happens? A sub A goes to, or let us use an equation instead of these goes to things, which are baby talk. A sub A plus the derivative of some scale, let's say lambda. And now fields under gauge transformations go past the field side times an E. And now I'm going to have to put in a Q, an I, and a plus or minus, and a lambda. And so you see what you've got here is you've got a gradient operator here. And so, and this is a time derivative here. So it's, so the form of this is, is, it's of the form gradient minus, it's this form. That's the structure that's embedded here. And that's the, the, what we call the covariant derivative, DA. And so acting on a field, you have the DA minus AA on the side. It turns out to be invariant because if you put a prime on this, what you get is DA minus, and this prime would be A sub A 
But then minus what was a Q here. Now let's have the Q. This is then minus DA lambda. And then you have here E to the plus or minus I Q lambda psi. And now when the derivative hits this term here, it pulls down. So we have, in other words, DA. Let me rewrite this. You have E to the plus or minus I Q lambda DA. And the part that hits there is plus or minus I Q DA lambda and minus Q A sub A minus DA lambda. And there's a Q here because the Q multiplies this side of that out. And let me see. I have it off by an I somewhere. Yeah, the thing that's invariant here has this thing is gradient over I and this is plus or minus time derivative over I. And so let me put a one over I here. And then that I goes. And now we see the sign we needed was the plus sign. All right, that's the sense in which it's gauge invariant. In other words, it's all noise in its own thing. However, there is, I should mention something. This business of gauge invariance and quantization is a subtle business. And when you quantize the electromagnetic field, you quantize it in one gauge. Then, you know, people talk about gauge invariance, but you really can't exhibit gauge invariance after you've picked a gauge and quantized it. In the path integral formulation, you can avoid choosing a gauge. And there, the gauge invariance is more manifest. Well, I've really gotten off on some tangents here. But here, you get a right hand. This chalk. Unfortunately, I can't see the end of the chalk. But what's left is three different treats. I don't know what they are. I don't eat sweets because my teeth are not very strong. Okay, so this is the non-relativistic thing. To make a long story short, let's add in the Pauli term. Minus Q over N, S dot P. So this is the Pauli spin term. So that's the non-relativistic part. Hamiltonian for non-relativistic part, charge M, charge Q, mass M, and spin one half in a magnetic field, or an electromagnetic field. And of course, what we're going to do is we're going to drop that off. Here, of course, S is H bar over 2, the Pauli matrices, and B is curl. All right, so that's that. Any more questions? Okay, so now we're going to look at this as a quantum mechanics problem. And okay, so 
And what I'm going to do is I'm now going to switch to atomic energy. I suppose the main idea here is to avoid the dreaded 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, which is kind of a good expression. Okay, so in atomic units, then we have 1 over 2m. That's supposed to be 2. 1 over 2m. P minus, now we have Q over CA. R and T could have written X and T. Plus Q. P. Well, to tell you the truth, in my notes, I have this as U. So I think we better. So we're going to atomic units, and we're also going from P to U for the scale of potential. U of R and T. And then minus Q over MC. That's not P. Okay, so that's our Hamiltonian. And as I said, we've dropped the constant term here. And it's kind of conical with that term. It's so big and you drop it. Anyway. So S, as I said, is H bar over 2 times sigma. D is curl A. Now what we're going to do to have a constant magnetic field is we're going to set A of R and T to be just A of R. And it's going to be just simply minus a half R cross D. B is a constant. And um, we're also going to be in the radiation gauge. Also, it's called the Coulomb gauge. This is to say A dot delta A. This is the gauge that's nice and physical and uh, quantize the electromagnetic field in this gauge. Um, everything looks kind of the way you expect it in the day. Neural traumas. Uh, notice in this gauge, uh, th this is in this gauge. That is to say, this choice respects the uh, Coulomb gauge because the divergence of A, well, it's kind of clear. It's that when you have R cross P, uh, it's perpendicular to R. And so if you take a gradient in the R direction, which is what the gradient is, you're going to get zero. And uh, just to see that explicitly, this is minus a half. Let me just write what this is. This is equal to minus a half, or let, let me put it this way. The ith component of this is minus a half epsilon i j k r j d k plus summed over j and k from one to three. Okay, so this is minus a half sum over i j k epsilon i j k uh, the i derivative of the j component times d k. And of course, that's zero because this is totally anti-symmetric, so I and J can never equal, so this is always zero. So we're in the, we're, we are indeed in the Coulomb radiation gauge. And now we're going to, oh my goodness, I just realized that I forgot I didn't finish the hydrogen atom last time. I mean, we sort of finished it and got the energy levels, but that's where I was supposed to start up. And somehow I got so absorbed in um, working out the uh, 
Hamiltonian for the charged particle, and I skipped that. So before going on, now that we're into the back to the hydrogen atom, do you want us, shall I quickly go get my notes for the last few things about the hydrogen atom before going on? I think that might be more appropriate. All right, so let me quickly do that. There's a little line on the top of my desk. So when you graduate, you've got a job all lined up. I hope not. Cameraman. All right, sorry about that. So let me just take a couple of steps back to this hydrogen atom problem. And remember what we found was we wanted CQ, which was 2L plus Q lambda, so NL minus 1, CQ minus 1, over denominator 2L plus 1 plus Q times Q. We wanted that to be 0, and that gave us the rule L plus K lambda NL is equal to 1, or lambda NL is 1 over L plus K. And we set this quantity L plus K equal to N, which is the principal quantum number. K is the value of Q at which CQ is equal to 0. In other words, CK is equal to 0. So CK equals 0. And C0 can't be 0 by definition, and so K is greater than 0. So K can be 1, 2, et cetera. L, of course, can be 0, 1, 2, 3. It's an order of quantum number. So N can be 1, 2, 3, et cetera. And the way we had arranged things was that lambda squared NL, or NK if you want, or let us say NL, is minus ENL over the ionization energy, which is 1 over L plus K squared. And that gives us that ENL is minus the ionization energy divided by this principal quantum number N squared. So in fact, the L, keeping that self-structured L was unnecessary, and the reason for that is the hydrogen atom problem has a hidden symmetry. So these are the principal quantum numbers, and the energy then, EN, is a nice way of writing it as minus a half mu C squared alpha squared over N squared, where alpha, which is E squared over H bar C in one set of units, E squared over 4 pi H bar C in another set of units, and something else in SI units. Anyway, it's 1 over 137. And let's see, do I have a... Anyway, there are, of course, many more digits. This thing is not very handy. In fact, it's going to be a talk on that, on alpha, in a few weeks at the colloquial by Keith Hall. He's going to talk about whether our alpha will be changing in time. Dirac thought 
force. Things were changing in time, and that's why Big G was so small. His reasoning was, how else could it be so small? I heard him talk about that in about 1977 or 78, and he was still very sharp. He was still riding a bicycle. He switched from, he left Cambridge and gone to, I think, Yeshiva in New York, and then he had gone to Yeshiva in Florida State, probably because he liked roses. That was one of his hobbies. Anyway, so what we have, since K is greater than zero, and N is equal to K plus L, what we've got is that L, and L is less than N, and greater than equal to zero. And so L runs from N minus one down to zero. And the number of states, the multiplicity of the, in other words, the degeneracy, because of the hidden symmetry, we have a degeneracy. The MGLs don't depend upon L, but they also, because of angular momentum symmetry, they don't depend upon M. And so they're independent of both. So the degeneracy of G sub N of the nth level is the sum L equals zero to N minus one, the values of L, and then 2L plus one of these, because M can have 2L plus one values. And now if you use that theorem, the first term, the sum of L from zero to N minus one turns out to be 2, N minus one, N over two, and the sum of one over the same range is N, and altogether that's equal to N squared. So the degeneracy of the nth level is N squared, and this is one of the reasons why we talk about degeneracy in perturbation theory. The general formula for CQ turns out to be one of the complicated expressions, minus one to the Q, two over K plus L to the Q, three minus one factorial over K minus Q minus one factorial, two L plus one factorial divided by two factorial, two plus two L plus one factorial C zero. So let's see, the case, when K, when Q is small, everything's fine, but when Q is equal to K, you've got a minus one factorial sitting there in the denominator. So for Q equal to K, this thing becomes one over minus one factorial, minus one factorial is infinity, this is one over infinity, so C K is infinity. So that's how that works, it's being sort of hidden, it's probably a federal, it'd be a, you can certainly rewrite this so that you don't have any negative factorials and the thing looks often more obvious that Q equal to K is infinity zero. And of course, if K were an integer greater than Q, then you'd have minus two factorial, that's also infinity. The constant C zero is determined by the normalization condition, which is zero to infinity G R, R squared, R and L, R squared. The first three R's, I'll write down for you, because P 
for the same room again periodically. One R10, so this is N equals 1, L equals 0, in other words, the S state. This is 2, A0 to the minus 3 halves, E to the minus R over A0. Here, A0 is the Bohr radius, and let's see, I need to, it's roughly half an angstrom. The actual formula for it is something I wrote down last Wednesday, but does anybody remember what it is? I'm seeing my notes. Here we go. A bar squared over the reduced mass times E squared. There's a point here then, just let me mention something about this Bohr radius. This is roughly where the electron is in the ground state of hydrogen, how far from the proton, and as I said, it's about half an angstrom. I think about 0.59 angstroms, if I remember. By the way, the extra figures here I've seen are 0.036, and I think it's 0.0036. And anyway, the point here is that if the electron were much heavier, this Bohr radius would be much smaller. And Blanchow pointed out, I don't know if he was the first, but he certainly emphasized it 20 or 30 years ago, that if one could find a stable negatively charged particle, in other words, if the muon were stable, or even better, if the tau were stable, then you could form atoms out of that stable negatively charged particle and a deuterium particle or a tritium nucleus, so a nucleus of deuterium or tritium. Then those two objects, deuterium and tritium, would come together, and the Coulomb repulsion would be screened until they got close enough so the strong, it's not really the strong force, but the nuclear force could take over. The nuclear force in the standard model is the remnant, it's the Van der Waals version of the strong force, the strong force being QCD, which is like quantum electrodynamics, but stronger and, frankly, but anyway, the idea is that the Van der Waal part of that is the nuclear force, the nuclear force would take over, so you could have commercial fusion very, very easily. Deuterium is available in seawater, it's one part per 100,000 million or something, which is a lot of seawater. And unfortunately, we have no way of taking into account stable particles, except the electron, heavier than the electron, let's say, which is too bad. Of course, you know, with the LHC, no one will know what will happen. There are all these elaborate theories, but they could be all headed to the shredder once the machine turns on. So we can hope that they'll find a negative return. Anyway, so that's the, this is the ground state. The S state in the first excited state, the N equals 2 level, is 2, 2A0 to the minus 3 halves, 1 minus R over 2A0, E to the minus R over 2A0. And then the L state, so this is the N equals 2, L equals 1 state. The radial wave function is 2, twice the Bohr radius to the minus 3 halves, 1 over root 3, R over A0, 
even minus r over 2a0. So you see that all of these wave functions keep go to zero exponentially as, one, as r over a0 or r over 2a0, probably r over a0 in general. Um, and then one other thing, remember what, what I said to you was that uh, r goes to zero as little r goes to um, infinity. Um, as, as little r goes to zero, um, except, uh, well, that's big R, but the thing that we were talking about was U, which is little r times R, and that also goes to zero even for S states. So, U is little r, big R, goes to zero, and R. Um, I've got some forward to erase. That's a great time to ask a question. Certainly not into Just a little bit. Yeah. Rotational cleanup. Uh, R21, R, and then an equal sign. All right, wait a minute. Let me get That equal sign? Yeah, that's what I believe. That's it? That's what I was thinking. All right. Same as this one, Rn1 of R 
sine theta e to the minus sine theta. So you see these are very simple trigonometric functions. And in fact, these are the L, these are the eigenstates of Lz, L squared and Lz, or L squared and L3. Um, one needn't have those, um, one needn't use exclusively those uh, eigenstates or eigenfunctions because uh, you might want, you know, for, for one reason or another, to have uh, different kinds of states. And you, you want them to be energy eigenstates, but they don't really always need to be, you don't need to always have angular momentum eigenstates. You can have states that are eigenstates of some other operator. Because if you have a state, it's bound to be an eigenstate of some operator. Um, it's own diadic, for example. Um, so what is done, and this is particularly done in chemistry, is that you uh, write down psi n px of r, and this is minus 1 over root 2 times psi n 1 1 of r minus psi n 1 minus 1 of r. And that gives you root 3 over 4 pi rn1 of r times x over r. And so now you see you've got something that's, that's, um, that increases along the x-axis. And uh, where, well, it doesn't really increase because it's 1 over r, but, um, it, it goes out along the x-axis and it falls off more sharply in the y and z directions. Similarly, you can have psi n p y, which is i over root 2, psi n 1 1 of r plus psi n 1 minus 1 of r. And this turns out to be root 3 over 4 pi r n 1 of R, so that's N1 of R, times Y over R. And then the Z1 is simpler, it's just psi N P Z of R is just psi N1 0 of R, because that's already square root of 3 over 4 pi uh, R N1 R times z over r because cosine theta is z over r. So you see, these are um, are um, the kind of wave function you might want to use if you're doing chemistry. If you want, in other words, this atom to, and you have another atom here, and you want to start forming a bond between them. You might want to have, and if they're both lined up in the x direction, you might want to have uh, the x wave functions there. Note something else that um, these guys are real functions. And I remember Schwinger saying once, unfortunately, no one asked him a question. And he's one of the really lost opportunities. But um, he said once, well, we only need we only need complex numbers in quantum mechanics because this electron is spin one hand, and so we were all, you know, I, I, I was really impressed. But you know, I suppose that's as bad about asking questions as some of you guys are. Um, but who be asked why? What is your guess? I'm sure he was right. Schwinger was one sharp cookie. Well, yes. <laughs> um, I, I think it is that you can, 
I mean, I'm just going to reinterpret what he said. What he meant was that you could do quantum mechanics with real numbers, and you'd be fine until you got to the spin. If you didn't have to deal with electron spin, you could just deal with real numbers. And you could see a little bit of that in my notes when I described the momentum operator and the angular momentum operator and the energy operator. What I said was these were generators of space or time translations. But I said something like R plus A is going to be R. Now you can say, you can call this E to some operator. A dot something you can call T. And what you know is that then you're going to have R plus A psi is going to be E to the A dot grad on R psi. And so this T then gets represented by grad. Now what we do in quantum mechanics is we're almost as bad as the astronomers for writing things upside down and backwards and with crazy units. What we do is we first of all say, oh, this is going to be R E to the I A dot P over H bar. And so we've stuck in I and H bar gratuitously. And so now this T becomes I P over H bar. And then you have to say P is H bar over I grad. And then you're sucking in all the imaginary numbers. But I think Schwinger's point was that if you just did this, you'd be fine. And if you do the same thing for time translations and the same thing for rotations in space, because after all I did rotations in space, this is a specific case of this. That's, I think, what he had in mind. And on the other hand, the representations of the two-dimensional representation of the rotation group intrinsically, it's basically the SU2 algebra, the defining of the two-by-two representation. It's SU2 and that's as generated as the complex numbers in the domain. I don't think there's any way of avoiding that. So I suppose that's what he had in mind. Now, how much quantum field theory you can do without that, I don't know. You can do a whole theory of scale or vector fields without any complex numbers. I don't know. But to some extent, in other words, it might be useful to write quantum mechanics in as simple a language as possible rather than putting in all these distracting things that are irrelevant. All right. Well, that's that. So that's that interlude there. So we were talking then about this same system, but we said, okay, let's now get serious and you consider that this electron is not simply in the field of the proton, the Coulomb field of the proton, but also in an electromagnetic field. And so the simplicity, we're going to look first at a constant magnetic field, and the constant magnetic field is B, and A is going to be minus a half R cross B in the Coulomb gauge, and we're going to use Pauli's experimentally motivated term for the interaction of the spin with the magnetic field. Wow. We don't have much time here. So in particular, in this case, Q U is minus E squared over R, so I've gone, ooh, ooh, wait a minute, I have screwed up here. Oh, no, I did it right. Okay. All right, I did do it right. So we switched here to atomic units. We were doing SI units for the 
from the previous case. And one of the nice things about the Coulomb gauge is that since, of course, P is the same as grad, P dot A is the same thing as A dot P. And, in fact, if you look at it, it is minus a half sum I to the K, epsilon I to the K, PI, RJ, AK. And now you can – let's see. You can rewrite that as – well, A itself was minus a half R cross B. And so this is P dot minus a half R cross B. And let me see. What did I do here? I did this thing too quickly. In other words, P dot A is P dot minus a half R cross B. P dot R cross B is this structure here. And then – no, this is a P. This is a P. Thank you. I don't even know the piece of candy. So this is the structure here. And this – you can think of that as B. If you move the K forward, if you want, then this is P dot R cross P if you absorb the one half. In any event, it's easy to see that P dot A is one half P dot R cross P or one half P dot L. And with that, then, I think maybe I'll – we've got about a minute left. So let me rewrite the Hamiltonian now. But we have to expand that square. P minus Q over C A squared. It's H then equals P squared over QM minus Q dot – Q times P dot A over M. And there's a C here. Plus Q squared A squared over 2M C squared. And then there's minus E squared over R. And then minus Q over M S dot P. M – is there a C there? I think there is a C. M C. In atomic terms. Now, if we now set Q equal to minus E, E greater than zero, we have H is equal to P squared over 2M plus E over 2M. P dot L – that's from this expression. P dot A is a half P dot L. And then plus Q squared A squared over 2M C squared minus E squared over R minus – plus E. This is an E. This is an E squared. Plus E over M C S dot P. Okay. One thing to notice immediately – let me write this as L dot P rather than E dot L. They certainly can use it. P is a constant. Notice that the coefficient of L dot P is E over 2M. The coefficient of S dot P is E over M – this is E over 2M C. This is E over M C. That means that the spin interacts twice as strongly with the magnetic field as the orbital angular momentum. Okay. That's a consequence of our original choice of the Pauli spin term, which is motivated by experiment. This 
is said to, this is called the gyromagnetic, this thing is the gyromagnetic ratio, this E over 2MC. And what we say is that the gyromagnetic ratio of the spin part of the electron is twice as big as the gyromagnetic ratio of the orbital part of the electron. This also comes out in the Dirac equation. It comes out automatically. It just falls out from the formalism. Whereas here it's put in by hand, but it's motivated by experiment. Okay, so we'll start with this next time, although there's almost nothing left to do, because you can write this as H equals P squared over 2M minus E squared over R, one term, and then plus E over MC, P dot, and then you have here a half L plus S, and then you have a term E squared, A squared, and of course A involves P, so E squared, A squared over 2MC squared. And so this term you can say this is equal to H0 plus H1 plus H2, and it turns out that this term, or the biggest, the strongest fields we can make in the laboratory, this term is smaller than these terms by about 10 to the 4th, and this term is smaller than this term also by about 10 to the 4th. So one can now do perturbation theory, and we have immediate eigenstates of H1 plus H0, and they're just the states NL, and then M, and then plus or minus. So in other words, they're the simpler states, the NLM, direct product with the one half plus or minus a half. In other words, these simple states are the eigenstates of H0 plus H1. So those are the appropriate states for analyzing at least H0 plus H1. And then this is a very small perturbation. These are exact eigenstates of H0 plus H1. Okay, so are there any more questions or corrections? I was wondering, as operators, P dot A equals A dot P as operators? Yeah, in this case, because we're in the Coulomb gauge. It's always true in the Coulomb gauge. That's one of the nice features. There are many nice features. Okay, thank you. Thank you.